Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Welcome back, everybody, to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. I cannot wait to sit down today and chat with my friend Chris Sikornik, who, get this, built his last company from zero to $147 million. Yes, wow, right? We're going to get all into how he accomplished that. But before we do, I need to remind you that there are only a couple spots left in my elite for the Love of Money Mastermind Group that I put together for 2018. Now, there's only a couple spots left, and it is for anybody that has a traditional business, online or brick and mortar, who is really in that multiple six figures range and says, damn it, this is the year, 2018, that I finally break through to seven figures. I'm gonna surround you with the coaches, the tribe, the people, the know-how, everything you need to make that happen in 2018. So if that's you, if you're a traditional entrepreneur with a multiple six-figure business trying to get to seven, then go check it out at fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. Again, that is fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. There is a video there to tell you all about it. There is tons of text, tons of frequently asked questions. And as you look through it, if it's for you, remember, again, only a couple spots left. So make sure you fill out that application right there. It's a real quick app, a couple quick questions. And when you do, I will schedule a phone call with you to answer any questions that you have. Again, that's for the love of money.com forward slash mastermind. Now, Chris Sikornik is not only a serial tech entrepreneur, he's also a great, great guy and a good friend. And like I said, he is a man who has built five startups that are worth over $250 million. Can you imagine the experience and knowledge that he has? Including his last one that he built from zero and sold for $147 million. Wow, right? But here's what I love about Chris. All of our conversations center around socially conscious entrepreneurship, or as he terms it, net positive entrepreneurship. So we're going to talk about how he built his last company, uh, what happened when halfway through he really wanted to quit, how did he keep going. We talk about why building a net positive business is literally the future and the only way to succeed going forward. We talk about what he thinks about money now that he's been so successful, And it's just an overall fascinating interview with a man who knows where the future of business is headed. So get ready, take lots of notes, because this episode is a game changer. All right, Chris, buddy, my man, I appreciate you being on. How are you? Hey, amazing, Chris. Thanks so much for having me on. No, you know what? Totally my pleasure. It's funny because this is just going to be an extension of that great conversation we had, you know, a couple weeks ago in the jungle in Costa Rica there at dinner. And it, it dawned on awesome? me that, yeah, it dawned on me you're the perfect guy to, you know, put in front of my audience and, and have this conversation about socially responsible entrepreneurship. So I'm pretty jacked. Amazing. So am I. I, I love that chat. And yeah, absolutely. What a great setting. So your IG handle is literally mindful startup guy, which I think says a lot about you. Uh, but people <laughs> typically want to know about my guest, you know, where they grew up, what their background is before we get into you know, all the great tips that you have to offer. Do you mind kind of sharing a, a Cliff Notes version of your life up to this point? <laughs> sure, will do. Uh, so I'm Canadian. I grew up uh, just outside of Toronto and have always been just super passionate entrepreneur. I grew up in a very entrepreneurial household. You know, my both my dad and my mom were, were building businesses my whole life. So it just sort of felt like a, a natural extension. That's where I went. Um I grew up kind of in the country, so, you know, part of the benefit was, I guess I, I missed out on sort of the street hockey games, but I, I had a computer, I got really into tech, and really just fell in love with, with this idea of building something out of, out of technology. And so I, I got really passionate about starting companies, and from a young age sort of went on that path. I took computer science in university and fell um, very like it was out of tune with reality. So I, I basically dropped out with one credit shy and started my first business then, which, which took off. And it was a super fun ride since then building, building businesses. 
That's amazing. So you did not technically graduate university. Is that right? <laughs> that's, that's right. My, my parents won't let me forget it. I, I'm one credit shy. <laughs> what's, what's, what's fascinating is I feel like well over half the people I interview that turn out to be you know, multi, multi-millionaires and successful, amazing human beings in society, they have kind of that same story where university was not for them and they always had this calling just to get out there, roll up their sleeves and start creating. Was that you? A hundred percent. Yeah. I, uh, I was just too, especially with technology, right? Because it's just so, so moving so quickly. So anything that's relevant now is, is it's 10 years before it gets into schools. And there's some exceptions. There's great, there's great schools and universities and colleges out there, but generally I'm sort of a self-taught person. I love to just, if I'm passionate about a subject, I'm going to learn as much as I can and just dive into it and figure it out. And I think that's been the, the case for every business I've done is I've literally known nothing about the industry <laughs> when I went into the business. Like I, my, la- my latest business was an advertising technology company, and I didn't know the difference between like CPMs and CPCs, and I, I was just a total novice. But I dove into it and was just passionate about building a business in that space and figured it out. It's amazing. You mentioned that both your mom and dad were entrepreneurs, and that's where you kind of got the bug from. What's your best lesson from each one of them growing up? Whoa. Um, well, my, my, one of the best lessons from my dad is that, uh, you know, it, all that matters is sales. And it was really funny, you know, in building tech startups in the dot-com era when revenue totally didn't matter <laughs> in the greater scheme of things at the moment. And, you know, I was just like, no, it's just all about users. You just have to build a user base. And he kept saying, no, it's all about sales. And, you know, in, in the long run, of course, he's right. <laughs> hundred percent, but it, that was a, a valuable lesson. Um, and from my mom, I think it's, it's connection, uh, to, to people. And, and this brings it into sort of a, you know, philosophy. Maybe we'll touch on a little bit later about building a business with, uh, your partner, your, your employees and how you, how you connect with them and, you know, treat them as you grow and scale your business and go through different phases of your business. You know, a 10 person startup, suddenly becomes a 50 person startup and a hundred person startup. And it's very different at every stage. And it can be hard as you go through those transitions. And so how you stay connected, keep that culture is, is super important. It's a great segue kind of into my next question. I got to brag on you a little bit. So you're kind of this serial tech entrepreneur as, as you described and, not only was your last startup Canada's fastest growing tech company, I mean, that in itself is a huge accomplishment, but then you ended up selling it for, I think what I read was $147 million. Congrats. That's insane. Yeah, thank you. It was a, uh, a wild ride. And, you know, it's sort of the, the life of the startup entrepreneur is very much, I call it sort of zero or hero. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're either going to gonna totally hit it out of the park or, you know, one day before your sale, everything could fall apart. And that uh, we 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 uh, we got lucky this time for sure, but it was uh, it was a great ride. I learned so much scaling that business, and as I say, taking it from zero to you know 170 employees over seven years. Tell us the story of that business a little bit. How did you go from zero to that size of a business in such a short amount of time? Well, in this case, I, I set out to do this business a little differently. Um, my past startups, so I've done five startups, and the previous four, I had you know sort of cobbled together money from friends, family, um, you know, but I'd never done the venture route. I've never gone for venture dollars. And it obviously has a whole bunch of different set of risks associated with it. And so this time I said, no, I really want to go build a big company. I want to go learn how to build and scale a sales team. And so it was a very different approach. And so I immediately from day one was like, no, it's got to have a sort of venture backable idea. And I sort of combined um, my passion for technology with with, with an opportunity I saw in the advertising space. And in hindsight, it's kind of an interesting, we'll we'll touch on this maybe a little bit later, but I I hate advertising. (laughs) So it was sort of an interesting, interesting concern. I, I love the technology. I love the passion of building the business. But when it comes right down to it, I was never really passionate about advertising. And I sort of feel like, you know, we were in hindsight, maybe selling, you know, more things to people that they don't need. But I was passionate about building the sales team. And I scaled it, um, and, but really sort of fell out of fell out of love with it, maybe three years into it, because it didn't wasn't truthfully aligned with my, my passion. I have a big environmental background. And it was sort of this conflict, to be honest. Uh, so 
uh, nonetheless, I sort of saw it through to the end, but now I'm, I'm shifting gears into some new directions, but it was a really cool experience that I, I want to be able to leverage the learnings for future, you know, whether I'm an advisor and other startups that are sort of in the social enterprise space or um, future startups I might do. Um, certainly when you scale something, you just, as I say, go through these different stages um, and, 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 you know, all the pitfalls along the way. I mean, I almost sold this company five times. It, you know, it, it came right down to it, it, right down to the wire where, you know, literally bags are packed because we're moving to a new city because this company is about to buy you. And then poof, it's like the deal's dead. So now you just got to keep pushing forward and move on. Chris, I'm really curious. You said a few years in, you kind of felt out of love with it and you felt even conflicted. What was the conflict and how'd you push through it? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say the conflict is I, I found myself very passionate about, about the technology side, the challenge of building uh, an advertising technology business and just, you know, sort of a brief background on that space. You have to take huge quantities of data and really discover the right target audience in real time and serve ads to people. And it's a very complicated technology. So I, I loved working with that. And the people I worked with were amazing. I just, I, I love the people I worked with. Um, extremely smart. And, um, but at the same time, I think that what I realized is, you know, this, this wasn't necessarily a net positive business. And what I mean by that, I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing a phrase from, from a friend of mine, Vision, who talks about net positive companies having a positive impact in the world. And I think that's super important. And if you don't have that alignment, then, you know, really for me anyway, I, I hit this point where I was like, ah, this, you know, of course I'm not like open pit mining somewhere. It's not that type of business, but at the same time, it's the advertising space. So I didn't feel aligned with my, my core values of environmentalism with the business that I found myself in. So how'd you push through that? How did you become aligned with it? Or did you just ignore it? I, I think it was hard to come aligned with it in that industry. Um, so my my sort of focus was, look, I, I got myself into this. I'd taken venture money. I'd raised, you know, $10, $15 million of venture money. And I had to see it through for my for my employees, for my investors, and for myself to really see that I could, I could build that business and find an exit. But I, I, um, I, I basically just, you know, pushed right through it for, for four more years. And it, I think it would have... Had I started a business that was ultimately uh, aligned with my environmental side of my my socially responsible side of myself, I think I, I would have um, never lost passion with it. And so I think that's that's maybe one lesson um, to pass on. Like I know a lot of smart entrepreneurs that pick pick an idea just because it's a good business or just because it can bring in revenue, and and that's not enough. I think anymore. I think. People want to make a difference in the world, and I think as I've come across other entrepreneurs that have aligned themselves with their passions, they're just never tired. They, they just they go to work every day super happy to make positive change in the world, and I can't say every day I was like that, you know, walking into an advertising business, and so I think it's just a maybe cautionary lesson to learn that. Um, really be careful about what business you get into. And, and so I'm really, I'm really passionate about this concept of, of net positive businesses. This is fascinating. Do you think that you would be this passionate about net positive businesses if you hadn't woken up and found yourself, you know, halfway down this highway in a business that was not necessarily a net positive business? Probably not. I think, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think everything gets put in front of you for a reason, right? And so back and say, oh, that's, that's how I ended up here. And that's how I ended up with a lot of knowledge about scaling businesses. And now I want to bring that to what I call, I call them ecopreneurs, essentially entrepreneurs that combine not just environmentalism, but social responsibility into their very core DNA of their business. And there's just some, and not only is it, is it, you know, a passion and, and really amazing, but these are phenomenally great businesses to be in, in this time. Like just from a purely investment point of view, this is the future. And so um, if you just take all the sort of moral things out of the way, it's still an incredible uh, business opportunity. So let's kind of get into that because this is really the meat that I was excited to share with everybody. You've brought up the term net positive company. Now you just brought up the term ecopreneurs. Describe these companies to me. What makes them different than the old way of doing business? Yes. So I think I think the old way of doing business is very much um, uh, very narrowly focused on returns. 
and um, you know even even modern companies uh, like take take Google Google as an example. Um, I mean, great company. I'm, I'm sure they're, they're doing great things in the world. Their motto for the longest time was "Don't be evil." And I think it's it's funny, but it's it's not. It's not, you know, a high bar. No, <laughs> that's that's like, you know, having a personal motto of like, I just don't want to get arrested. Like, it's not, <laughs> it's not a, a high enough bar in my opinion. I think companies have to set the standard for, um, you know, where their values are. Because if you just sort of take a, a higher level view of of the world and and the issues that we have, at least even just from an environmental perspective for a second, you know, the vehicles through which most of this damage is occurring. Our companies, you know, it's it's not individuals, and yes, we all have to reduce consumption and so on. But the vast majority of, you know, how things get done in the world, how how environmental, how the world is being impacted, is through companies. So I think it's important that these very companies have this core sense of social sustain social enterprise within them. And what I mean by that is is they just have to. I mean, they don't all have to be have green products, but they have to minimize their impact and not just minimize. It's not just about maintaining status quo. It's about actually giving back. So it's giving back to the world um, in a positive way um, so that, you know, there's there's many companies that have this example. Um, Tom Shoes is a cool example where, uh, you know, for every shoe that you buy, they give away a, a shoe to someone who needs it, a child who needs it. And that's just a really cool example of, of a company having that built into their DNA. Mm-hmm. And so it's what consumers want as well. When do we start seeing this shift? Because I've only been aware of it over the past couple of years. I know it started before that. When and why do you think we started to see this shift? I think, I think it's happening. It's happening all over. Um, it's definitely a, a rising tide for sure. And I think we've just, our eyes have been open to um, seeing the impact of kind of the old ways of doing business. And a lot of millennials in particular are sort of looking at this like, look, look, what, look what the direction this world is headed. I want to make a difference, right? And, and it's not so much about, look, I want to consider assume I want to just have like, you know, 10 houses and private jets. I want to, you know, I want to give back and I want to make a positive difference in the world. Look, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. It's just, we have to be aware of what impact we're having. And I think really head in that direction of, of, um, leaving the world in a better place than, than when we received it. It's funny you bring up the millennials and, and I'll throw in there, even the Xers right behind them. Um, yeah. I literally feel like, and I'm interested to get your take on this. We live in a time now where they don't care anymore about what kind of product you're pumping out. They care about the entrepreneur and their intentions behind that product. So it's not good enough anymore just to have a good product. They want to know who is the guy behind or the woman behind this. Um, what do they represent? You know, what, why yes. are they doing this? Do you think that we're in that time where that has to be equally as important as anything else? We are. It's the, it's the, absolutely. It's the whole story, right? Pe- people love the story behind these products, and and the more you can give that to them, I, I think I think the better. That's exactly what people want. It, it because it's it's the it's the essence of what that company is, right? Um, when it boils right down to it, wh- what does that company stand for? If if a company is a person, you know, what's their personality? What are they standing for? And I think there's no better way than to sort of plug directly into the brain of the founder. Um, and we can do that now through through all the million social media channels that are available um, and get a really good insight into what's the motivation behind this entrepreneur that's building a business. So your dad taught you, you know, one of the best lessons you received was all that matters is sales. And now here we are talking about, you know, socially responsible entrepreneurship and everything else that needs to be <laughs> So how do you reconcile, um, let's say, that great advice with the good of, you know, the impact that the company's making these days? Well, I think that's just a perfect, uh, you know, example of the shift that's occurring. I think, I think in 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 his generation, that was the that was very much the case. It was just all about sales, and there's still validity to that. Look, I mean, like we we operate in an economy that has certain um, constraints and rules. Um, you know, <laughs> quite frankly, accounting is broken because it doesn't take into account you know various impacts. But uh, um, that said, I think there's a shift to this there has to be a greater purpose. And my father growing up, you know, wasn't it, he emigrated from, from the Ukraine. So he came over as a, as a young kid with nothing. 
And I think his generation was very much about, look, I, I want to pull myself up and I want to support my family. And so to him, that was his focus. And I'm the, I've been the benefit of that for sure. But now I can sort of, as a result, look around and say, look, it, it has to be more than more. It has to, you have to give back. Yeah, we're always evolving. I love that. So does building a net positive business present a different set of hurdles than we've seen in the past? Yeah, I, I think it does. And, um, you know, obviously it's hard enough just building a startup. <laughs> like the, the, the chances of, of a startup succeeding regardless are, are micro thin because it's just so hard to make it through the hurdles. So I'd say, yes, it's harder in the sense that you have to take into consideration more variables. Um, but at the same time, I think I, I'm going to sort of challenge myself on that because I, I think if you're aligned with your passion and you're really passionate about it, your customers are going to see that. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot easier for you. So I think there's some challenges in that you're, you're obviously having to take into consideration more than just like making your quarterly results for your investor. But at the same time, hopefully you're, you're getting investors that are aligned with, with your values. And, and that's the other trend I'm seeing is I'm seeing tons of, of um, socially conscious investors that are, are wanting to, uh, you know, have tons of funds and they want to place their money in net positive businesses. So that's another massive trend that I see. Is the trend large enough? Is there enough money out there for socially responsible startups or does the awareness still need to grow? I, I think uh, the smart investors are getting in now because I think this is like Bitcoin was <laughs> a couple <laughs> years ago, right? I think this is, this is the beginning of something massive. And so I think the smart money is there now, um, but it's very early days. And so I think you're going to continue to see a massive shift. I mean, look, there's, it, we've got a lot of momentum in the wrong direction. So it's going to take some time. But I feel as though what we really need are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of socially minded startups that are out competing the legacy businesses. And that's one massive way to make a difference because not all of them are going to succeed. But I think all you need are a handful of those to succeed and display some of the legacy businesses that are that are doing damage in the world. Mm, I love that. You know, we had a great conversation that night at dinner in Costa Rica about who's changing the world in the biggest of ways. You know, guys like Elon Musk who are currently doing it. And I think I remember you saying something, correct me if I'm wrong, that the entrepreneur that'll likely have the most influence on the world is probably just a kid right now or maybe not even born. What make, Do you remember this and, and what makes you feel this way? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I think... Uh, you know, I've got four kids and I think there are, uh, you know, potentially hundreds of Elon Musk's that are that are little kids right now. And they're seeing, you know, they're looking to, to the today's entrepreneurs as, for guidance as, as their role models. And I think it's really important that, um, you know, that not only do we set a good example as entrepreneurs today, but I think it's just so uh, amazing and positive and hopeful that there are there's this shift occurring. And so what we really need to do is give these kids the tools to really build the next sort of, let's call it social Google or social Facebook, socially minded Facebook. And, um, you know, that, that my colleague entrepreneurs to, to, uh, succeed. What can parents do to help steer their kids in this direction? Or is it not the parents responsibility? Is it society's responsibility? I mean, I, I believe it's a, you know probably a combination of both. Obviously, the, the parents you have matter, but there's tons of examples that you know people have have had really challenging childhoods and have gone on to to really um, succeed beyond beyond imagination. So I think as parents, we should um, look. We we don't even know the technologies that are coming around the corner in 10, 15 years. So I think we have to be supportive of kids that um, maybe think outside of the box. I certainly did as a kid and. Um, what you really want to do is is steer your child, um, you know, towards their passion because I think that's what they're they're gonna ev get up every day and not think of it as work if they can be working on what they're passionate about. You know, I, I don't say this just because I'm interviewing you. I, I I really mean this from the heart. I feel like you have some of the most remarkable children I've ever met in my life. You know, I've gotten to spend a, a decent amount of time around them now, especially there in Costa Rica. So how do you want your children to grow up viewing entrepreneurship and 
specifically money, because we talk a lot about the views and the perception of money on this show. Ah, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, yeah, my kids are are unbelievable, uh, unbelievable little kids, and um, I, I I see in them, you know, me and a lot of hope and and how we can how we can steer the future. So, I think um, I, we've we've made a conscious effort to try to expose them to as much as possible in terms of travel. So we've traveled with them a lot. We've exposed them to different cultures. And, and I think you can you can just learn so much through travel. So that's been a big core component of what we've done. Um, obviously, we've been, um, I don't want to call it brainwashing, but I think we've approach because you can't you can't rely on, um, you know, companies to sort of set your course. I mean, there's a lot of great jobs out there. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I've just met so many friends that have been in, you know, big positions at banks or whatnot for 20, you know, 15, 20 years, and then just they're gone. They're just let go one day. So you can't count on that. And so I think just the entrepreneurial angle is something we've tried to strike home. And <laughs> my 12 year old's already launching a business. So it's, it's <laughs> off to a good start. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. How do, so let me ask you this, because we talk a lot about money mindset on the show. How do you view money? Is it good? Is it bad? How would you define it? I mean, I've had an interesting relationship with money. I think, um, I think, I, I don't think it's inherently evil at all. I mean, I think money is just a vehicle that you, you know, has value and you can exchange it for different things. And so, um, where I think you get into trouble is, is just the pursuit of, of something that's not filling you up. Right. I think there's, at the end of the day, you don't really need need that much to be happy. And I think that's where we get caught. We sort of believe those ads, you know, those ads that are talking about you need this or you need that to be happy. And so I think it's just totally false. And um, so I'd say I'd, I've had a complex relationship with money because I was very focused on achieving financial freedom. Like when, and it's, it's a little uncomfortable to talk about it, but, but I, when I was a, a teenager, I was like, look, I want to make by the time I'm 25. Why I had that goal And I, you know, um, I look at that and I say, look, it's because I grew up in a really entrepreneurial house and I've sort of been unpacking, you know, how did I get that drive? And I think a lot of it is because of my father who grew up with very little. And look, I mean, you know, as a 14 year old, he was like picking tobacco and tobacco fields and, you know, traveling by himself to, to raise money so he could send it home. So he had very little and was very driven about money and success. And he crushed it. I mean, he built some massive businesses and did very, very well. And I'm a bit of an echo of that. Like, I think I grew up thinking that that's what you should do only. And that's the focus is, is, you know, providing for your family and really building. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think we're all driven as, especially men to, to provide for your family. But at the same time, I think, um, I maybe missed out in my early years on, on having that passion or that purpose behind it. And I think that's, that's the shift that I'm personally going through. That's, that's a long winded answer to money. No, it's a, it's a, you know what? That's exactly the kind of answers that we love here on this show. And you brought up something else. You said, it, you know, it's possibly a masculine trait, or you said, especially us as males, do you think it's a masculine trait to pursue wealth or, cause I know you have a wildly successful, uh, epic wife as well. Is it, uh, could it be a feminine trait as well? I think it, I think it can be both to be to be successful and really um, uh, you know exercise your gifts really in in a way and but I do think you know men in particular you know it's that idea of like okay like we're going to the hunt and we're we're going to kill the woolly mammoth and and bring it home I feel that's that's ingrained in us or at least I feel it and uh, so really understanding that is is important because you know why are you pursuing this like what's and and my um, I'm going to quote my my better half here, my wife, Lindsay Sikornik, who's a, who's a leadership expert, because she talks a lot about currency and this idea of like, what is your currency? You know, there, there's lots of forms of currency. Like for me, surfing is a massive <laughs> currency. And, you know, I you, you could if you said you can't surf or, I'm, you know, I'll pay you a million bucks, but you can't surf. Forget it. Uh, you know, that's a high value currency for me. And so I think you really have to understand within yourself, you know, what are your currencies so that you can truly figure out, you know, where you're, where you're putting your attention. I love that. So, you know, you've moved from Toronto to Costa Rica and 
specifically an area in Costa Rica where, you know, there's still a lot of dirt roads and everybody still lives very humbly. Do you feel like your view of money has shifted getting out of North America and moving down to Costa Rica? A hundred percent. Um, you know, good, good things are at the end of dirt roads for sure. And it's, you know, but it, it was, I traveled as a, as a teenager and as a kid as well. So, I mean, I was, I was going through, you know, rural Thailand years ago and seeing, you know, people that are not, you know, that are, that are living with very little yet are extremely happy. Um, really honestly. And, and down here, the Costa Rica, the Pura Vida, you know, way of living is just that it's, it's a very passionate and happy culture. Um, I actually am super fortunate to live in one of uh, the blue zones. Have you heard about the blue zones? Oh yeah. It's one of five, right? Yeah. Yeah. This, this area is one of five blue zones and it's the area. There's only five and um, it's where the average life expectancy is, is of centurions is greater than anywhere else in the world. So I think there are more people that are over a hundred here than anywhere else in the world. And it's, it's partly because um, I think just that, that, um, less anxiety. I think the the focus on just pursuit of just solely wealth is not here at all. I think it's about community. I think it's about obviously it's healthy. Everybody's walking everywhere. Um, they're in nature, which is super important. I mean, the the amount that you get back from that uh, is incredible. And um, yeah, it's just a super healthy place to live. Yeah, every time I'm down there, I can literally feel it. You know, you know I've got a borderline jealousy <laughs> that you guys have moved down there. Maybe we need to come join you. <laughs> So Absolutely. we do a lot of highlighting of generosity on this show. Um, as a matter of fact, the tagline is when good people make good money, they do great things. What role has generosity played in your success? Well, I've been the, I've been the benefactor of a lot of knowledge. And I think I've uh, been gifted um, knowledge from many people along my path to how to scale businesses and um, you know, just grow into who you are. So I think I think that's been a gift uh, to me, and I think it's it's important to absolutely integrate the idea of give back, and and not just in your business. Um, you know, you can you can do it anywhere, um, and so I think generosity plays a, a key role in um, certainly how I've sort of evolved to to be where I am for sure. From from the gift of others, giving knowledge is is a huge component. We try to highlight giving back as much as possible. As a matter of fact. There's one question I ask every single guest, and it's really meant to inspire those who are up and coming to give back a little bit more. So I've got to ask you, yeah. what is one of your most favorite moments of giving that you've ever experienced? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Hmm. I, nothing's like immediately popping into my head. I, I will say that I am in the process of, um, building a community pool down here. And there's, it's, it's remarkable that, um, there's a lot of surfers were around water down here and there's a lot of people that just don't know how to, how to swim. And in fact, there's a lot of surfers out there that are locals that don't know how to swim, which is scary. And so I'm involved in building a community pool down here. And when I saw the look on uh, kids faces at, at this local school talking about, uh, building a pool there, your eyes absolutely lit up and it was, it was a great, great moment. That is so cool. You know, every time that we're out there the past couple of times, I know um, I've seen where your children go and buy supplies um, for the kids at the schools and stuff. I just, I love the way that you guys have such a giving heart. It literally represents you and Lindsay and the family. So thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Let me ask you this. Uh, what's the next exciting project for you? So the, next exciting project for me is I'm really quite passionate about uh, taking this, this this idea of helping ecopreneurs uh, to the next level. And so I'm thinking about how I structure that. I'm contemplating even potentially doing a podcast around it and really building a, a, a knowledge bank for up and coming entrepreneurs that have that socially, you know, conscious view of the world and giving them information, access to advisors, I've even toyed with the concept of putting together a group of investors that might invest in these uh, types of startups. So it's it's unfolding as we speak. I've sort of been de decompressing from five back-to-back -back startups, but I'm I'm slowly getting plugged back into this idea of of combining finally these these forces that have been passions in my life. That's incredible. Do you feel like you can make more impact as someone who has been wildly successful, um, not only in 
building companies, but also financially? Or do you feel like we can all give the same amount of impact? I know I'm putting you on the spot here. I, I think, um, look, I think everybody can have an impact and it, and it really starts, starts with you. I think the, the, um, you know, anybody who is looking after their kids is giving back in a massive way. Anybody who is involved as small or as large is giving back. I think that certainly entrepreneurs have and, and successful people have the potential to have really good impact as well because they have some financial means to do so. so I would, hope that along the way they figured out how to do this. And so that's what I'm thinking about is, can we integrate giving back into the very companies we create? And I think that's a cool concept. And of course, I love these you know billionaires that, that have created this wealth and then choose to give it all away. That's incredible too. Look at the impact they're having. Um, but of course, you know, hopefully along the way, they're not building companies that are net negative <laughs> because then it's sort of like, it cancels itself out. So I think, I think uh, absolutely. I love it. So where can we find you uh, when people want to follow you? Where's where it best to find you? Well, I think Instagram's a good one, just at Mindful Startup Guy. And I'm um, also on Facebook, um, uh, facebook.com slash C Sikornik. My last name is terrible to spell. So I think uh, Instagram's probably the best way. <laughs> All right. Last question. I ask everybody this question. I love the diversity and answers I get. And that is, why should people be unapologetic about their pursuit of wealth or success? Hmm. I think that at the end of the day, if you've got a, a passion, there's, there's nothing wrong with pursuing that at, at full speed. So I think that if the side effect is that you become wealthy along the way, pursuing that passion, then phenomenal. Maybe it's that you, you, touch a lot of people along the way. That's phenomenal. Maybe you, you, you know, hit it out of the park and then donate all that money back. That's phenomenal. So I think it's, it's all about, um, pursuing that passion. I love it. You just gave everybody permission as to why they need to pursue that passion. Chris, I totally appreciate your knowledge, your time, everything. I know it's going to make a huge, let's call it a net positive impact. Chris, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.